and gentlemen, Greg Proops. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out to this inaugural podcast as we venture into the world of the interweb, uh, live, uh, en vivo, as it were, from uh, Bar Lubitsch here in bustling West Hollywood. Uh, if I could describe the, the ambiance of Bar Lubitsch, uh, uh, sort of a, a, I don't know, Brothers Karamatov meets Weimar Republic meets 1890s gay bar meets where the mafia would have its prom if it was a satanic coven. Uh, <laughs> I dig the atmosphere here. Uh, I didn't realize it was going to be full of mirrors and tasteful nudes. I don't know if you have tasteful nudes out there, but there's two in the cubby hole back here where I'm, I'm performing from the, uh, the, the extraneous area above. Uh, and there's, there are two very tasteful nudes that appear to be, uh, what's that word people use? Ru Rubenesque, uh, Zoftig. So welcome, initiates, nov uh, novices, fellow travelers, uh, stargazers, navel gazers, acolytes, comedy fans, and confused bystanders who've been caught in the collateral damage of what you thought would be the opportunity to see a funny free show on a Thursday night. Mm. It's called Bar Lubitsch here, and uh, I, I assume it's because Lubitsch directed near here. Uh, I, I think I'm going to keep in mind uh, as we go through the podcast, uh, uh, Lubitsch's greatest direction. I, I think it was in the David Niven book. He did a take, and he, I think they were mooking Bluebeard's what is it, Bluebeard's eighth wife with uh, Claudette Colbert, and Niven plays a nitwit in the scene, and they do the scene once, and um, Lubitsch laughs and goes, that's good. Could you do it again? And then they do it again, and Lubitsch goes, that's good. Could you do it again? And then he does it again, and Lubitsch goes, that's good. Could you do it again? And Niven goes, well, Ernst, what do you want me to do? And Lubitsch goes, mm, do it better. <laughs> and I think that's the greatest comedy direction ever given. Uh, when you're making comedy, I think, better. Mm. So I'll try to keep that in mind. I'm not, I'm not swearing to it. This show's called The Smartest Man in the World. Uh, this has not been uh, delineated or, or no one's actually announced this. Uh, I'm simply campaigning. Um, <laughs> stumping for the role, if you will. Uh, I was going to ask people what they were reading currently, um, but I'm going to tell you what I was reading. But first I want to jump into this. Uh, uh, just so you don't think that I'm up here um, blowing smoke up your ass, as it were, about being the smartest man in the world. I went to the College of San Mateo, which is uh, a junior college uh, in Northern California, uh, which actually was a high school with ashtrays. I went there in the 70s, and there were ashtrays. Um, my favorite class was Psychology 101 I had with Mr. Devonshire because I would come in late, um, still on acid from the night before, and Mr. Devonshire would be outside in the hallway smoking when he would show a film, which was always because he hated talking to the class because we were unbelievable poltroons who were 19 years old from San Carlos in Belmont. And uh, so he'd be outside smoking and I would stand outside and smoke with him and he had a, a collection of pre-Columbian art. Uh, he, he was a very interesting man, Professor Devonshire. One time I was taking a plane to see my family uh, or whoever they are in Arizona and uh, <laughs> this was in the days when you could smoke and drink on the plane, which by the way were the greatest days of all. Uh, I'll, I'll get to it later about security and everything else, but in those days, the security was lax, uh, awesomely lax. Uh, you could carry Coke with you, an automatic weapon, a dog, whatever. There was like the, the scantest, most minute. There was kind of a crappy metal detector. Uh, and I, I don't even, I don't think there was an x-ray machine yet in the 70s. I remember getting to a plane two minutes before it took off and making them open the door and let me on try that now. Uh, it sounds quaint and curious. It does. It sounds like, it sounds like we took a horse-drawn carriage up to grandma's house to have some nog or whatever, but uh, you could actually get to the plane at the very cocking last minute, and if the door was closed, make them open the door, and they would let you on the fucking plane. Uh, the comedian Bruce Baum told me once he stopped a plane on the tarmac, and, and uh, they opened it and let him on, and that to me... Is, is quite an achievement, especially in this day and age. I would like nothing better than that, really. And then to be able to light up smokes and just get drunk. They used to have piano bars on planes. I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, like 747s had bar areas where everybody stood and smoked and drank and got pished. And there was a professional piano player that went on the plane to play shitty show tunes that you could just get drunk and probably, for all I know, make out in the bathroom with people you met on the plane and stuff. Now you sit in a horrible seat. If you're on Southwest, they make some jokes. I, I, who, what, what airline did I take last week? Uh, one of the airlines, Horizon Air, someone, the dude wrapped the safety instructions. Oh, fuck, yes, yeah, someone in the crowd just went, oh, God. Which is exactly your thought when the wrapping starts. You're like, oh, fucking Jesus wept. Uh, really? You're going to wrap the instructions? 
Um, that's going to date this flight, like the movie Johnny Dangerously has breakdancing in it. Uh, it's going to really date something, you know what I mean? Um, but instead, you know, I kind of got in the flow. It was a horrible jet. It was one of those 24-seat ones in the bathrooms all the way in the back, and it's a chemical toilet. And if you're over four foot nine, or you're not like a, you know, a Polish dwarf from the 18th century, you, you hit your head immediately. And then they never have a sink that works. There's a piece of tape over the sink, as if some horrible crime has been committed <laughs> in a communist country in the 50s. Like, it's a really bad. And then, and so they, they have the little uh, pull-out... Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, sanitizing wipes that are beyond the smell that sticks with you for the rest of the day. Like eating a Subway sandwich, like it never quite leaves you for the rest of your life. Hours later, you're like, oh, fuck, I have to bathe in sand to get this off of me. <laughs> Horrible flight. So Mr. Devonshire and I were on the same flight. Uh, it was a, 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 a one from San Francisco to San Diego and then San Diego to um, Phoenix. So we get, oh, I see him at the airport, and I'm wicked fucking late. My, my Aunt Elaine drove me, and I showed up really late, and she was mortally fucked off. And, um, uh, but I used to smoke and drink with her at the table when we were teenagers, which was, that's why she was, I wasn't with my parents, which made it cool. So in any case, we get to the airport, and um, I run on, and he goes, hey, Greg. I go, Mr. Devonshire. He goes, let's sit in the back, because you get served first. I'd like a, pre a professor at a university now to make that kind of commitment to his students and provide that kind of succor and comfort on a flight where the, he knew I was heading home to see my folks and I didn't really want to. And um, I just think if more professors offered to get you drinks quicker, maybe this country would be a little bit better. <laughs> Call me a, a rebel, if you will, but I, that's how I feel. I'm almost ready for another drink myself. Ooh, that's good. So we sat at the back of the plane, and I got down three vodkas between San Francisco and San Diego, which is about an hour and ten minutes. And, uh, and when I got off the plane in Arizona, I was wearing a, a three-piece suit because I'm mentally defective. And uh, it was approximately the, the temperature of the planet Mercury in Arizona when I got off the plane. And I was hammered beyond all fucking hope. I was maybe 19. And uh, in a three-piece suit with a scarf on... <laughs> with bell-bottom pants and lots and lots of hair and giant Diane Keaton and Annie Hall glasses. And I staggered off the plane and my dad goes, you're fucking drunk. And I went, you gosh, you know, hey, dad. Uh, well, there was a hi, hi, pop, I think was what I quipped. Uh, apparently, I was channeling Satch from the Bowery Boys at that point. A lot of the jokes tonight are for me, uh, so don't feel... Don't feel obligated to pretend you know what the fuck I'm talking about. Later on, you can go home and, I was going to say Google them, but use a better search engine than that that's less oppressive. <laughs> use a search engine that doesn't, like, you know, perform clitorectomies on Chinese babies or whatever. <laughs> Almost certain Google does, does that. Or something devious like that. Uh, so, yeah, I went to the College of San Mateo, and then I went to San Francisco State, uh, where I never graduated, but I did major in uh, marijuana and chasing around like an asshole. And uh, also took theater, which is a very rigorous uh, field of study. Uh, I think you'll find uh, having to go to class every day and read plays and listen to professors talk and have professors hold you in unseemly ways uh, a little more difficult than you might think. It didn't require a lot of study, uh, but very good times. One of our professors, Mr. Flood, I'm almost sure, was wearing some sort of S&M rig under his suit. And... Uh, Every time he made a horrible motion, like he'd do, he'd do like little quirks to the left and right with his neck and whatnot, we would think that was the moment that the, the S&M suit was straining upon his nether regions, and therefore he was receiving ecstatic signals during the whole, the whole of his lectures about the most un imponderably tedious eras of theater, uh, uh, you know, the French Restoration and shit like that, just Racine and whatnot. You want to just tear your eyes out. And the, Whenever I go to Paris and I see a, a statue of Diderot or Racine, I think, fuck, you bored me to death in college. Um, and I know you were hilarious in your day. You know what I mean? They're like Red Skelton or whatever. They're left for future generations to think how fucking not funny they were. Uh, thank you. Red Skelton was a comedian. I know. You'll go home and you'll... Whatever. Uh, right. So today I was watching the, uh, uh, the Chilean miners